friends, it's Carly and I'm back again with another review. We are still taking a look at the Shang-Chi Legend of the Ten Rings action figures and today we're just going to keep it rolling with our next figure, Death Dealer. So I asked you guys which one you wanted to see next and I didn't really get very much of a response and I kind of felt like this is the one that people were most interested in. I think he's a really dynamic looking figure and it is always a lot of fun to see where the MCU is going to go with the villain in their picture. So this is the main villain and I did my research like I always try to do um, on this guy and it's interesting because there really isn't a ton to find out about um, the Death Dealer. I found a really great article from Screen Rant that I will link in the description below that had like 10 things comic book fans will know about the Death Dealer. And he really is sort of a mysterious figure. He only appeared in the comic books four times, which is really interesting um, and makes sense kind of as a creative choice for the MCU as a character to choose uh, because they can really develop him without sort of sullying the old material. There's a lot of growth possible for him. He has a son, which um, although his son was really sort of soundly defeated in the comic book universe, in the MCU there's the potential for um, him to be defeated in this first movie and then maybe his son to come seek revenge later. So that's always a kind of a fun storyline. Um, but there really is not a lot of information available about him. I believe that his name in the comic books is Li Ching Lin. Wait, is that right? Let me check. Yeah, Li Ching Lin. And he is a part of an underworld organization. Um, there are some really cool sort of iterations of his abilities. Like, um, by the time his final appearance comes around, they've really sort of played up the Death Dealer name and so his costume sort of featured a lot of skulls and he actually would throw cards um, at his enemies as he was going to defeat them which I think was kind of a cool thing but it does sort of recall Taskmaster and Gambit in a way that I think nobody really wants to see in a you know in a in a, another character being brought into the MCU. Um, so it makes sense that they would sort of erase those elements with those two characters already out there. Actually Gambit isn't out there yet, is he? But hopefully he will be soon. So um, I understand removing those things. I really like the way that he looks. I really love the use of traditional dress and the sort of like um, half mask. But again, you guys know already just looking at this figure before I even start talking about the articulate points, the most interesting thing for me about this particular action figure is just talking about, you know, what the elements that were provided with here tell us about what might potentially happen in the movies. Because once again, we're sort of left with this half body covered um, in vinyl figure that is going to be, while very beautiful, I do love everything about the way that he looks. It's going to end up being more of a statue than it is an action figure, which is always a disappointment to me. Um, Again, particularly in a line where we're dealing with martial arts centric characters, I just I just can't see any excuse for doing them like this. Um, I think that the benefit of having more flowing robes, using cloth, making use of um, materials other than plastic and vinyl would have really behooved Hasbro on this set and they didn't do that. Um, and I do think that there's probably some good reason behind that. You know, I mean, there's a durability issue. These toys are built to be for you know, children what ages four and up, so um, or usable for children ages four and up. But you know, as a collector, it's disappointing again to see that I have an action figure that I'm really only going to be able to set on my shelf, just like this, um, without much ability to move him. We will go through the articulate points. Let's go ahead and look at um, the accessories that he comes with, and we'll talk about some of the things that I learned from that cool article that I read. So Death Dealer only comes with two hands. So his weapon of choice is a, uh, well, at least what in this article is ref uh, referred to as a triple bladed um, knife. So here are his throwing hand right here, which really reminded me of the gambit that we just got, the retro gambit. And then here's one with him just holding a knife. So um, they're cool. They're great looking. Again, with the, there's something about, I don't know why when, I, when I'm looking over all of the elements of this figure, I just keep seeing those two, 
those two characters, even though they took out the most marked features of them, they took out the, you know, the skull and all of the skeletal things that they ended up doing with Taskmaster and that exist in Taskmaster. And, um, you know, he throws knives, so he's going to have a throwing hand like a Gambit throws cards and and they change them, you know, he does use knives and cards in the comics, so they changed it to just knives uh, for the movie and with this character. I don't know why I got that in my head and I can't get it out. Let me know what you guys think. Am I just on a rabbit hole and being silly or do you see some similarities between those two characters and the way they designed this one? Um, so those are the only accessories that he comes with. With the body armor that we're seeing with him, I'm really sort of intrigued. At first I was a little bit miffed, a little bit annoyed by it. It seemed really inappropriate in um, conjunction with his traditional dress. Again, being a martial arts character, having these um, metal plated knee pads and, uh, you know, sort of arm guards that really sort of harken back to, or remind me, excuse me, let me get focused here, of the G.I. Joe action figures, which I absolutely love, but they just didn't feel appropriate here to me. But when you go up, you can see that he's also got this metal plate here, which makes me wonder with his covered face if we might be seeing some kind of like cyborg element to this character, if there's something, um, I don't know, to that nature, which I would really enjoy. It'd be kind of interesting to see how they work that in, if that's what they were going to do. But he definitely, we get a hint that his entire body is armored, um, which makes the knee plates and the arm plates and the hand guards make a little bit more sense and actually make the, you know, um, those choices a little bit more intriguing to me and make me wonder more about the character. I love the painting of the mask. I don't know in Chinese culture what this is called. I didn't um, think to look that up, but it sort of reminds me of a Japanese kabuki mask, which is pretty cool. So if anybody knows the name of that traditional piece of, um, I don't know, piece of armor or gear, let me know what that's called, that mask. And with the face mask, um, I just think it's really cool that we get no idea of who might be under here. And I think that works to, um, you know, the filmmaker's advantage greatly. I'm really excited to find out what we find out about this character. And especially seeing that he is plated from head to toe, or at least from the neck down, it's interesting to consider what that might mean for the way that we um, see the character in the movie and the types of interactions he has with Shang-Chi and the rest of the characters in that movie. So let's go ahead and look at the points of articulation top down. We've had just really great um, movement in the head. I feel like they've done something different since I've been away um, and I really like the way the heads are moving. That They have this nice like rocking motion. Um, he does have like a ponytail but it doesn't hinder anything at all so that's great. Even with the um, sort of vinyl overlay going a little bit over the shoulder line. It doesn't affect his lateral lift on his shoulders at all. And the arms overall are great. We're not having any problems there as we haven't so far. That's not the problem area when you have these kinds of costumes. But here we can see we get a nice bend in the elbow. Um, we have a nice turn in the bicep here. We've got hands that turn and bend beautifully. We don't have our rocking side to side motion, but we do have a front to back motion on these. Um, and it is front to back on both of the other hands too. So the arms are great. Now we get to the center of the body. We have no type of ab crunch whatsoever. So no bend forward, no bend back. We have no type of, um, you can turn the waist if you get up under there. So if you do get up under his um, robes. You can turn his waist, so that's fine. There are slits on the side, but the way that uh, the asymmetry of the tunic itself, the way that it goes slit up here, will get some pretty decent movement on the right, but the slit still does come down over that hip line. So when we're trying to lift it up, we're still running into, 
you know, the natural hip line is beneath the slit in the tunic. So it still doesn't get as high as it can go. The other side, it's open. You can see, I don't know if you can see, I'm going to try to get good light. I'm working on my lighting, guys. Um, but this is an open slit that goes all the way up. You can see here, and is just hooked by his belt. Um, which does not come off, by the way, is not removable. But again, now you can see where the natural hip line is here, right here. So we are able to part that slit. Sorry, I'm trying to get focused. This is a very awkward angle to try to get focus on. We are able to part that slit there and get a little bit of a lift there. But again, because of the asymmetry on the other side, there's just a natural tug that happens in the center of the tunic that is pulling pulling these legs down. Like they're bumping up against the vinyl and not able to get all the way out. So again, because we're not able to get all the way up, we're not really able to turn as much. I mean, you can, I guess you really can sort of get creative and get some poses. The right leg is much better than the left. But as far as, you know, like a standing pose with a leg up or a leg kicking or anything like this, it's going to be really difficult to, to balance and to move the legs the way that you want them to unless you have him sort of, um, I don't know, maybe with like a waist, with one of those stands that will hold him in the waist. It's just going to be difficult. The tunic just throws the center of gravity completely off. You just can't get a great, um, wow. And then inadvertently, I just got this really like incredible pose. I think that's so funny. <laughs> I wonder if I could ever actually get him to stand this way. I'm going to try to get him to stand this way. And if I can, I'll take pictures and share it with you guys. Because I think this pose looks really, really awesome. And I just sort of accidentally did that. Talking about all the ways that I was agitated by him, and this really looks incredible. So we'll see how this goes. If we're able to get him to stand this way, then I might like bump up my rating a little bit on <laughs> the posability of our death dealer here. Overall, not overall, completely from top to bottom, this is a beautifully sculpted and painted figure. The pattern on the tunic is beautiful. They did different pattern work on every single um, piece of vinyl that we've looked at so far. So we've got um, the trim has a different pattern carved into it. The paintwork is perfect. The mask is absolutely beautiful. The hair looks great. Um, I love the selection of colors. The underside of the tunic is red, which I think is a really sort of dope effect. It's just really cool. That they didn't miss an inch when they were adding the details and like painting and choosing the colors and putting all of these thoughtful details into it. Again, it's just when they have this, this piece on here, it's difficult to get the variety of poses you might want to get from this type of figure. Um, that said, I think this is kind of a dope pose. Like, I don't know that it's appropriate for the character necessarily, but it's kind of fun and we'll see if we can get him to stand this way. I'll let you guys know for sure. Overall, like I said in the beginning of this video, I think the best thing about this Death Dealer action figure, first of all, is he's gonna look beautiful on your shelf however you end up finding a way to display him, whatever um, position you put him in, even if he's just standing there, he's absolutely stunning to look at. Um, even if it's more of a statue than an action figure, you have to give credit where credit is due and as far as creative, um, you know, the creative effort and the top to bottom finishing that went into making this look this good, they really succeeded. Um, but the most intriguing thing is looking at all the elements together and just wondering what this character is going to come together as on film. That's what I'm really excited about. I think that Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings is going to be one of the best movies coming up and I'm really really excited from them to you I mean um, I'm just really excited to see what these characters are going to bring to the table and I don't know having a character that I'm not familiar with I'm even more excited because it's all going to be new to me so I've sort of decided to wait on comics until I see the movie just so that I don't um, have such a fresh mind to 
the original story when I come into this new story and then I'll go back and read the comics later. Let me know what you guys think of that. Like what order would you do it in? If you are a Shang-Chi fan, do you think I should go ahead and read the comics before I see the movie or should I watch the movie, enjoy it for what it is, and then look at the source material afterwards? Let me know how you're going to do it. Let me know what you recommend and let me know what you think Death Dealer is going to be like in the new movie, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Thank you guys so much for watching my reviews. It's great to be back. I have a live stream coming up. I finally got my Hellfire Club figures and I decided I wanted to open them and talk about them that way. So stay tuned. I will post an announcement when that's going to happen and I will be back next week with another review. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you guys are having a great week. Bye friends.